restricting the labrum tear yes for sure it does help us in clearly defining how much is the extent of labrum tear but also helps us in understanding some other pathologies which might be troubling the patient which has come with an instability it could be an alpsa lesion which is basically an anterior labrum periosteal sleeve avulsion so that's an anterior labrum periosteal sleeve avulsion which is happening that's an alpsa lesion there could also be a, uh, a disruption in the glenoid articular cartilage which is also called as a glad lesion so if you look here there is an articular cartilage disruption along with the labrum tear so that's a glad lesion here or it could be a hegel lesion which is actually discontinuity of the inferior glenohumeral ligament so rather being a damage towards the glenoid side the damage could be basically on the inferior glenohumeral side ligament on towards the humeral side so these are additional uh, pointers which actually change our treatment scenario whenever we do these investigations so for me all these patients who are coming for an instability need a thorough clinical examination a very detailed history especially the history of a previous surgery being done and a 3d ct scan and an mr arthrogram before i take these patients uh, for my theater thank you very much any any questions Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, let me thank uh, Dr. Amit Nath for uh, asking me to give this talk here. This is about cricket, which is a very popular sports in uh, India. Um, I went through the literature when I asked when I was asked to give this talk. Though I see quite a few number of patients with cricket and shoulder pain in my clinic, I thought uh, we should make a good literature search, and there is very little literature about cricket, very little. And most of the data are coming from Australia rather than from uh, India or North America or Europe. And uh, the common injuries are from bowling. This is uh, not only about shoulder; it tells about everything. Okay, this 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 slide only. Bowling is 41 percent. Fielding, wicket keeping is 29 percent. Batting is 17 percent. And lower limb is a common site of injury. Upper limb is only about one fourth of all the injuries that we see. And acute injury is uh, most of them are 65 percent. So what we see in shoulder practice are chronic over his injuries. And this is from Australian cricket injury data. So just to isolate the shoulder uh, shoulder injuries acute shoulder injuries are about 2 out of 16 so people chance of getting shoulder dislocation or something like this is very rare okay in acute shoulder injury very rare okay but you get you get repetitive stress injury the prevalence right now is about 0.9% of them will have shoulder problems batsmen have less bowlers have very high and the bowlers 
fast, fast bowlers have the most common type of uh, shoulder problems. And in the fast bowling, those who are having front on action type of bowling will have more shoulder injuries. And bowlers, you know, uh, there are certain important facts that we need to be aware of uh, cricket. Uh, depending on the bowling speed, they get classified as either, whether it is a fast, fast medium or a slow medium and even express. So if they can bowl at a speed of more than 41 meter per second, then it's called as express bowlers. And basically the ball velocity actually which determines their how effective their bowling is going to be and how they are going to play. Then ball velocity depends on run up speed, how speed they run up during the uh, bowling and leg and hip rotation, shoulder rotation, arm action and hand and wrist. So if you see arm action and uh, uh, run up speed makes up almost two third of their ball velocity. And ball reaches batsman in kind of microsecond, 0.4 second it reaches the batsman. So it's coming at such a high speed. So to, I went to go through the biomechanics. There is very little literature about uh, cricket biomechanics, but you will find a lot of literature about overhead athlete, which is more talking about baseballs. Sure. Yeah, baseball because it's based in North America. I think we see more literature there. Uh, there are some similarities between baseball and cricket, but there are a lot of differences also. One has to appreciate that. In baseball, when they are throwing, we see they start with a wind-up where there is a preparation phase. And then cocking is when where their arm is kind of gone to abduction extent to the extreme extent. And then acceleration phase where they are throwing it. Deceleration where they are slowly receding the speed and follow three follows up, up after that. And this is the sequence that happens in the baseball. But if you see what is happening in the cricket, in cricket at no point the bowler's arm elbow is really flexed at all. They are fully extended elbow and they are doing a circumduction movement. See, if you see the top picture, they are doing a extended elbow. Here the, their elbow is flexed and they never come to the stage of doing a abduction extension rotation at all. So they don't have that cocking face as it's seen in the baseball or any other overhead athletes. Overhead athletes are common like swimming, basketball, tennis, all have a similar mechanism but cricket has a slightly different mechanism. And cricket bowling, there are papers which have shown the sequence which has been split into various stages. What exactly happens when they are bowling it? And initially they start with a run up. They acquire some momentum of speed. And they come to the stage of pre-delivery stride where they kind of slope to some extent and then they put one foot on the next foot. And then they go to the delivery stride where the uh, leading, the right hand batsman actually puts the left foot on the, on the foot, uh, on, the, on the ground. <coughs> And then ball release happens. And the ball release happens at a deceleration phase. It's very interesting to know that. But really, does throwing happen in uh, cricket? Yes, it does happen to some extent in fielding and wicket keeping when they are throwing the ball. And uh, bowlers, when they are practicing for the session, they are doing the throwing mechanism. So throwing does happen in cricket also. And the workload of throwing can be sometimes very severe also. I just want to tell you a little bit about fast bowling techniques, what the bowlers practice. And commonly they practice like three techniques, side-on technique, front-on technique or mixer technique. The side-on technique, this is the one which is supposed to be uh, legal and they can they are allowed to practice in a right way. Here, they come with a low run-up speed. But when they come to the crease, we see the foot is almost parallel to the popping crease. And the shoulder is in about 180 degree alignment to the wickets. But if you go to the front-on technique, they come with a very high speed, run-up speed. And the when the foot strikes on the popping crease, it's almost on the direction of the ball that travels. Okay. And the body turns almost more than 180 degree, like almost 240 degree they, they turn up. And there is a technique where they combine both methods, semi and front on both together. They come up with like front on and then when they start bowling the ball, it will be like a front on technique. So these are three techniques that have been recognized. But in general, if we split up and see what really is happening biomechanically there, Run of speed is about 6 to 12 meter per second. So they are going, coming quite fast. And pre-delivery stride is only one step they are taking which is doing about 0.42 meters. Half a meter they are jumping in. And delivery stride happens with back foot strike, front foot strike and ball release. Ball release occurs only by circumduction of the shoulder joint, glenohumeral joint, where the 40 to 50 percent of ball speed is delivered by circumduction only. And some flexion and extension of wrist occurs along with carpal joint movement. And the throwing, if you see, if the arm is deemed to have been like extended with ex with bent elbow, then they can be called as illegal. 
and they they count as almost called like a foul basically and the decision done by the umpire normally see the bowling angle though the circumference is almost at high the bowling really occurs at around 15 degree plus or minus 5 and there have been biomechanical researches measure the distraction force that is occurring during this bowling episode and they found out actually when during the uh, 27 degree only the maximum distraction force has been identified it's about 600 newton which is after the ball has released so after the ball release only you get more maximum number of force coming through the shoulder joint if you look at the spin bowlers they have a combination where they have to give a speed also that ball deviates from their axis so they have a like two things swing ball where the deviation before the ball bounces and the deviation after the ball is called cutting balls but in general the shoulder function is they have to regulate the forces generated by the leg and trunk and also do the ball velocity also precisely so shoulder is in the brunt of most of the time during the whole action of bowling you know throwing though is very little in uh, in cricket but those fielders they actually average in on average they throw about 30 to 40 per day and more than 70 throws are considered to be risky for shoulder injury which has been demonstrated in ba in uh, baseball studies so bowling workload is actually shoulder motion does not have a cocking phase at all as you see in the overhead athletes distraction force is more there which is occurring during the circumduction and which is required around 600 newton which is quite high power, high uh, amount of force is being recorded and while bowling the arm can be rotated even up to 6000 degree per second which is very high but how the shoulder handles these forces so if you go to the pathophysiology the major factor for us is to rotator cuff muscles which kind of dynamically stabilizes when the shoulder is being circumducted and active tension within long adductor biceps during the process of circumduction also stabilizes the joint so both structures are at risk of injury due to repetitive stress and also due to acute injury when the force exceeds its capacity so another way throwing workload as it occurs in th there is also some throwing involved in this this is exactly throwing same throwing mechanism like in any other abduction external rotation attitude where you have extreme abduction external rotation anterior capsule becoming tight loose so that they have subtle anterior laxity posterior capsule becoming tight so migration of humeral led internal impingement and uh, some rotator cuff tear so basically if you see external rotators and internal rotators have to act coherently during the process of bowling and also during the process of throwing so what do we see clinically in this patient a lot of patients come with shoulder pain majority of them are coming due to the uh, shoulder pain occurring due to shoulder impingement as a result of uh, posterior superior impingement and occasionally we see labral tears and slap lesions i have seen some case of uh, paralabral cyst also and shoulder impingement syndrome is uh, part of the similar spectrum of anterior laxity posterior capsular tightness labral tear and migration of humeral head and rotator cuff tear so clinically apart from routine clinical findings i think we need to work on the function of the scapula which has been emphasized in the earlier talks where the scapula is rotated is it rotated and where is there is there any scapular dyskinesia and uh, assess the range of motion the same phenomenon of glenohumeral internal rotation deficit which occurs in overhead athletes can also occur in uh, cricketers though uh, and they can also have the slap, slap lesions especially when they are saying pain on throwing or catching pain think about slap lesions and do clinical tests for those but the main stay of management for most of the shoulder pain will be conservative because most of them can be sorted out by physical therapy measures and injury prevention technique by injury prevention by technique assessment and modifying the way they are bowling and uh, agonist and antagonist ratio which is the ratio between the internal rotators and external rotators if we try to optimize it and uh, they can have uh, uh, less risk of having injuries and posterior capsular stretch for those who are having GIRD classic glenohumeral humeral internal rotation deficit then you can try this surgery is only reserved in very refractive cases I have done only in two or three patients actually where one is a patient with a 22 year old who came with shoulder pain for 8 months duration keen bowler uh, he came with MRI already showing paralabral cyst and along with the posterior superior labral tear so they already did a aspiration outside which doesn't work normally because there is a labral tear which needs addressing not the uh, cyst needs drainage so where uh, uh, i had to go on do cyst identification and uh, annihilation of the cyst the cyst was located more on the posterior aspect here now the putting the anterior portal the rotator interval 
to speed up this uh, slide a bit. And uh, you started seeing the post portal and you see you start seeing a big cyst and you, I'm just freshening the labral tear first of all which is located in the posterior superior aspect around uh, uh, 11 o'clock position. You can see that uh, labral tear around the uh, posterior superior aspect. Once you are delineated the labral cyst. So that's the cyst in the posterior superior aspect which once you start inoculating it, you start seeing some jealous fluid, gelatinous fluid coming out, which is a cystic fluid coming out. So once you do that, then you, you got to switch to the labral tear, the tear, which is the primary reason why. It's the cause. Yes. It's the cause. Yeah. So that's the cause of the labral cyst, paralabral cyst. And uh, this, you have to stitch the posterior superior labral tear. So basically, for um, cricket injury prevention is the main strategy. First of all, you need to identify a player, identify your postural defects, bowling technique what they are using. If they are using poor bowling, to modify those. And physical attributes are also very important. Their athletic ability, aerobic capacity is also important. High physical demand. Sometimes the players are in an extreme anxiety to get the ball as, as much. So they use their more than what they, their power can do. So those has to be addressed. And fast bowlers are the one which are the risky one. And the papers show that the target for the bowlers should be like 66 percent of concentric strength of internal rotators. They should have at least, and the same way, 100 percent of eccentric strength of external rotators. If they can achieve that, they are optimized for doing the bowling practice. So uh, I generally advise for them to have the isokinetic exercise with the resistant band, thera band, do pectoral stretch, shoulder retraction, rotation movements, and cross body adduction and abduction. And summarize. Shoulder injuries are common in bowlers and fielders, less common in batsmen because they don't do much overhead activity. Distraction force in shoulder is much more important and throwing workload also contributes to the injury. Clinical assessment can identify the players at risk like identifying the scapula position, scapula stabilizers and the risk assessment. Proper training and therapy can prevent the injury. Majority of shoulder problems are impingement and they can be mainstay of treatment is mostly conservative and most of the time it is physiotherapy. Surgical indication only in refractory cases. Thank you. Thank you. Very uh, good uh, talk. Any any questions? Um, is, is there any any something anything that we, you will treat them differently from uh, dislocators that are not bowlers? Uh, routine dislocators. Yeah. If you, you have a you have patients that are dislocated sportsmen but not uh, cricketers, not bowlers, and you have bowlers, anything that you will do significantly different? In terms of uh, physio? In terms of Management. physio operation, anything different? Uh, I'm not able to understand the question, sorry. No, what, what I'm it's not on cricketers. Huh? If you have non cricketers and you have cricketers, bowlers, anything that you, in, anything is, you know, specific? that you do different in, in these patients or anything that you have to take into consideration in order to not to restrict their uh, their external tension, you know, anything specific that you will be more yeah. focused on when you, when you treat them? To anything special for the bowlers rather than the other picketers? What do you mean? Posterior capsular stretch, where you try to do the poster because they have a. What he is trying to impress is huh. basically when you talk about bowlers, they must have their full range of the external rotation. So you must maintain that, you must not over tighten the capsule. So that sure. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. That's yeah. The thing. This, is, <coughs> this is the second time I'm asking this question today. I asked a couple earlier. Um, uh, we, we have a typical scenario of a throwing shoulder, posterior capsular tightness, anterior humeral head translation, <coughs> a consequent. Um, uh, anterior capsular tear and uh, we treat this patient by you know just simply seeing uh, repairing what we see and then we put him back to bowling again and uh, where do we go I mean we, we, we probably about two years down the line land up the same scenario or he can't bowl at all so I mean what are we doing 
think the, probably the first thing that you, as you said, if they've got a good deformity, you need to address that before you take them to surgery. Sure. If you've addressed the GERD and you've got rid of that internal rotation deficit, and then you've taken them to surgery and they've got an anterior labral pathology, then you do that. But this is a, and then he, the aim of whatever you do is to put them back to sport. And we know that sport is not a physiological. If this man bowls 25 overs a day yeah. for about 90 days in a, in a year, apart from his practice, he is putting abnormal physiological stresses on his shoulder. Yeah. So whether that pathology will come up or something, or there will be one day when he'll have to give up bowling. Now, we were discussing this just now. There have been a number of Indian fast bowlers, and Jawagal Srinath is one of them. He bowled till his last day in test cricket, but he could never do an overarm throw from the field. He used to feel a long leg, and all his throws were underarm because he could not throw. So he could not put his arm in this position yeah. because he had subtle instability, but he could still bowl. And that is what you've highlighted. Yes. It's so different from a throwing uh, in, 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 in the bowling is completely different. But I'm sure circumducting your arm for about you know 30 times, 680 times a day, yeah. 90 days a year is probably is not physiological. You're going to cause some tissue damage in that. So I guess if you have addressed the GERD and taken surgery, you fix what you see there. Yeah. I think general con general consensus is if you have uh, GERD deformity, I think we should not allow the player to play until that is sorted yeah. out. Absolutely. Right. So if they are not having, if they are having GERD again probably should not be allowing to play, correct it, and then re restart the game. Recheck in on a regular basis of, okay. the, of the players. One option to treat the GERD is to do manipulation on anesthetic and to get the last bit of internal rotation, and then treat them uh, with physio for rehabilitation. Okay, thank you very much. No um, the next speaker is uh, Kapil Kumar. Uh, emerging concepts in arthroscopic instability repair techniques with implants, instrumentations, and techniques. Go. You know, shoulders have been dislocated since Hippocratic times, and the iron rod was there. Then Bankart told us about the Bankart lesion, and that has been there forever. So, and things keep on evolving. But I think to understand evolution, you must look at history. And you learn the le best lessons about the future are learned by, from books in history. Mm -hmm. So let's have a look at what's this glenohumeral joint. Oops, sorry. No, I don't have access to JP hotels. <laughs> Sorry, just a second, let me just get rid of this. The question that we have to answer is not that why does the shoulder dislocate. I think the question we have to answer is why does it not dislocate? You know, that articulation that we look at, it's not a ball and socket. It's this it's this ball on the the dolphin's nose, you know, it's the, it's the golf ball on tee. So why does it not dislocate? You know, we, we put all sorts of stresses, we lift heavy weights, we score a try and we bounce off the ground and uh, we still don't dislocate it. We bowl 180 overs and whatever, we still don't dislocate it. So there must be something. And as um, uh, Ahmed told us earlier on by the role of the labrum and its function, I'm not going to repeat that, and the ligaments. So it's this whole capsulolabral complex that I allude to that we have to uh, think about. And this is what happens. You dislocate, you detach your labrum, you get an impression fracture at the back. Lights, you see the Light off. Lights off. Light off. Yeah, it's hard to see the, the video. But it's just not the, the labrum that is being avulsed from there. It is the, the, the capsule undergoes a complete plastic deformation, and we have to think about that as well uh, when we are dealing with any instability. So you not only just don't look at that, the whole capsule is touched before this, banca, before this labrum has got avulsed, and look at for any associated cuff injuries as well. So what is our aim? This is what we're trying to do, and then we're going to look at how we do it. We're trying to restore the capsular labral complex, reattach the labrum, and we're going to address any 
associated injuries, whether it's cuff or it's bony defects at the same time. And our aim is to restore the normal mechanics, as we just heard. We want to restore the external rotation in the thrower or the bowler so they can go back to doing their sports. So this is what our aim is. We want to achieve a capsular labral repair. We want to mobilize the labrum. We get a north-south shift. And remember, the inferior suture is crucial. So all the evolution that we hear is trying to achieve that and is trying to minimize our failures. If you look at the literature, there is still a failure of about 5 to 67 percent. Probably 67 percent is us. We are not doing the surgery in the appropriate patient or the appropriate operation in the appropriate patient. And there is factors are the age, the gender, and the trauma, but also these things. Are we adequately addressing them? And if you split this further from Burkhardt and De Beers work, if there's no bone defect, you've got only 4% recurrence. If you've got a bone defect, you've got 67%. And if you've got a contact athlete, everything else goes up by about 1.5 times. So what's new? And I thought about this. What's new in stabilization? I've been doing the same thing for about five years, six <coughs> years. What's new? The new anchors, the new instruments, and there are new techniques. Let's look at them. Now, when uh, Amit did his talk this morning, he alluded to various anchor materials. So now we have had metal anchors, we have had bioabsorbables. Then we sought out to look for, and then we had problems with the bioabsorbable, where the bio not less left these huge defects in the glenoid and the glenoid fractures. So we looked at different materials. We thought, well, ideal is if you make a hole, and then that thing there gets transferred to bone. So we went into biocomposites. So we've got these various biocomposite designs. We started by tying knots. Then we thought, no, knot tying is not very good, so let's go knotless. And then we found this one, which is the all suture anchor. And as we've heard from offer, they don't do very well. So first came the juggernaut, and now you've got another one from, uh, I think it's Linvitech, which have come out with, uh, yes, why not or something. That's called why, it's called why not. So I said, but why? <laughs> you know, but why? So, um, so th th that's the other thing. Suture passage. I'm sure Offer is, as he alluded to the old man in the, in the hall, he would have started with putting needles in and passing threads to them. There was a huge difficult to get to the inferior portal. We had the curved needles. We had the, the uh, then came the sixters, the various other suture <coughs> passers. Then you've got these uh, suture grasper and uh, tissue grasper and passes, the, the scorpion and other things. Yes. You've got the, the spectrum hook and the acupass. Mm -hmm. And this is the new one. This is the new kit on the block, which I just saw very recently. It's from Linvitech, and it holds a suture, and it passes the suture the same once you pierce through it. So it's an, it's an advance on their spectrum needle. So this is what is happening. They are trying to make our lives easier. But I think we were managing OK. With the key still is that you want to go <coughs> as low as possible and try and Oh, sorry. Turn your Wi-Fi. It's like turning your wife off. Can you do that? Wi-Fi. Yeah, I know, but wife and Wi-Fi are the same thing. Yeah. Also. <laughs> Operate remotely. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Need an <a> access code. <laughs> yeah. So these are the things which are happening around suture passage. There is a lot of things which are trying to make your life easier, to make suture passage easier. But the key still is your technique. It is you who has to evolve. And I think the biggest evolution has to be in the surgical expertise and technique. So then I thought, OK, that's the soft tissue bit. What's happening on the bony side? Now, Steve Burkhardt and Judy Beer told us about this um, engaging hill sacs lesion. And I, I'm sure. Others will probably disagree with me, but in my mind, every hill sacs lesion has engaged at some point of time. That is why it became a hill sacs. If it did not engage, it would not have been a hill sacs lesion. So anyway, so so how do we address this large bony defect at the back and uh, uh, and try and minimize the risk? Because we've seen that if you've got a bone loss on either side, your risk uh, of recurrence goes up significantly high. So what do, how do we deal with this case where there's no soft tissue, as Pankaj was just uh, we, 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 sorry, we were just discussing, you know, there was no soft tissue. They've got a large bony defect. What do you do? So till now, we used to, at least I still do it, I would just convert to a latter jay. But then I'm told, no, this, you can do this. You can do a remplissage. Nice word. What does it mean in French? Don't know. OK. So you put two anchors in the, in the defect, and you, you reattach, or you move the ad ad 
the attachment of the infraspinatus back to the to this defect. And then so how is it different from a putty plat, which was done in the front? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it sort of refers to McLaughlin. Okay, so how is that? <laughs> so we are doing that. So that is something that is new. It's up to you whether you choose to take it or uh, or leave it. Is it just a flavor of the month? And next we'll have another new monthly special on the menu. I don't know. Yeah. But then I thought, okay, what happens to the results of these? And I know there is a talk later on on remplissage and uh, bone blocks. I will not go into further uh, in a lot of it. So there is a, this met a systematic review looked at seven studies, 220 patients. Now, in the global sense, it is not huge, right? And they said, good functional scores, no significant loss of motion. I said, great, hurrah. You know, this thing works. But they, none of them said how big the hill sacs lesion was. So they saw a hill sacs, and they plugged it with this infraspinatus in the posterior capsule. So that hill sacs might not have caused any trouble in any case. So we are still saying it, it is working. So we don't know whether this, this procedure works or how physiological it is, and whether in 15 years' time we'll be standing in and saying that was an awful procedure that remplissage, you know. Oh, I don't know who designed it. So I don't know. But it, that is evolution. If you call it evolution, that's evolution. Now, latage is not evolution. It's been there for years. The French have been cutting the biceps and the coracoid in the same breath at the same time. So, uh, and for those, I'm sure everybody knows what a latage is, but you've got a either engaging hill sac lesion or a bony defect, you plug the coracoid at the inferior edge of the glenoid, and it works by increasing this arc, as well as by doing a, a sort of a subscap, subscap sling, where it prevents this inferior part of the subscap to rise high because of the conjoint tendon preventing it, so it works. And similarly, the Bristol, we heard about the Bristol this morning. Bristol's worked, Bristol worked with the same principle. But this is the evolution, or is it? Again, I leave it for the wiser members in the audience to discuss it. So instead of making a, a cut about five, six, seven centimeters in the front of the shoulder and doing it open, mm -hmm. Laurent Lafosse thought we must expand the arthroscopy. So he made about, I think it's seven portals, A to M or something like that. I forget the letters of the alphabet. So you start at the back and you make this number of portals, and this portal where you put the saw blade is about three centimeters in diameter. And I did it on a cadaver, and I thought, hmm, I counted up, I measured up all the incisions, and it was probably more than my open operation. <laughs> but apparently, the theoretical advantage is that you have got better visualization of the brachial plexus, better visualization of the nerve, and it's safer. I'd, I argue with that, but that is what the theoretical advantage. So uh, you can go to uh, Lauren LaFosse's institute in Annecy to be trained on this. I went to Boston to get trained on it. And now Smith and Nephew have got this jig as well, which they are developing. I think they are doing with Pascal to develop this uh, jig to do a, an arthroscopic latter -day. So again, that is new. That is evolving. Whether we'll find a pot of gold or this rainbow will go when the clouds and the sun, uh, <laughs> uh, when the sun shines from a different angle. I really don't know, but Wi-Fi is after me at the moment. Yeah. So, whether that elusive pot of gold we will ever find at the end of this rainbow, I really don't know. But just to say that this is a picture taken from my front view. It's a view from my house. Thank you very much. At the end, I think. It still remains, we've got these surgical techniques, we know what to do, and technique, instrumentation, everything else will keep on evolving, but remember, it's not the gun, it's the man behind the gun who matters. Thank you. Good break. Thank you very much. Any questions to Kapil? I think the last phrase was, uh, was lovely. You know, there are some people I know, um, unfortunately, when a new gadget comes out, then this gadget is, is, is a mallet and everything else is a nail and they bang on everything. And then you get disasters. You have to, to find the, the, the best solution for, for each patient and not use one thing for one thing that fits all. Yeah? Mm -hmm. That's it? That's it? Yeah. So Epoch is not here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, chairpersons, and uh, thank you all the speakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah. So, um, 
if, if we retain the chairpersons, if they are happy to, and uh, we go ahead with some master videos. Uh, Sanjay is in a bit of a hurry, so we'll just skip the sequence, if it's okay with others. Yeah? Sanjay, he's, he's in a bit of a hurry, so. So, so wants to show the video first. Uh, the arthroscopic lethargy okay, good. one. Is that all right? No, no, no. Thank you. Um, and then we'll follow the sequence, Sergio and then Devashish. Okay. Yeah? So, Sanjay Garde on an arthroscopic lethargy, please. This actually is my daughter's charcoal painting. She does charcoal painting, so that's her. Are you okay or you want some help? I am not sure. In a minute. Okay. Can I help you? Finally? Yeah. Will you pay me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Thank you. It's not always image. It's a device. Shortcut. I am a good friend, that is if he gets it working, uh, Ashish is on it. This is, I am just going to share with you a little technique that I have tried to devise. It is not entirely new in the sense that it is not originally uh, my technique, but I have tried to modify a little bit of Laura LaFosse's technique and as uh, I was mentioned earlier, yes, I did uh, spend some time with him, so I have seen his technique in detail and what I thought was that uh, the debate here is not whether Lataji is the surgery for the future or it is not. The question here was if it is at all the surgical technique which is a good technique then it is a little difficult for the standard average Indian patient to be able to afford that technique given the fact that you do end up using a lot of consumables and disposables. So I was trying to move towards a technique where I could try and do that job with as much, as much precision as is possible as reproducibly as is possible and if I could uh, I got it. and uh, uh, as safely as is possible. Thank you Ashish, thanks. So uh, I am going to share with you a technique which is new. It is uh, it's, uh, it's just coming up to a, an year now. So it is the earliest patients that I have done have not even crossed a year. So it is a little new. There is about 24 patients at the present point in time and uh, this is how I tend to do it. I tend to do it in the beach chair position. Initially, I used to use a little bit of attraction on the arm and uh, I am sorry but I would disagree a little bit that no, the portals I do not think will add up to an open incision and I do not think that the osteotomy is done by the saw any longer. If that was the case earlier, it is with the uh, osteotome which is barely about a centimeter in its uh, diameter. The the surgical steps are divided into these following five steps. Okay, this is just for ease of understanding. Obviously, one would flow into the other. But when I started doing them off, I had to set a mental uh, clock for myself, a stopwatch for myself that I should not be doing one surgery for the rest of the day, for the entire day. So I needed to sort of have a time frame where I would do the diagnosis say in the first 10 or 15 minutes, then I would dissect the coracoid in the next 35 minutes or 40 minutes, then I would do the osteotomy. So eventually so that I finish the surgically surgery in appropriate time. And if I thought that I was not going to, then in the very early cases before the study started, I was to actually open them up and do the fixation open as a part of learning curve and this was explained to the patients beforehand just so that I would not compromise on the fixation quality. Now the first step, this is the right shoulder, you are looking at it from the posterior portal. The first step is to actually identify the extent of the defect and mark it. So I am marking at 2 o'clock and 5 o'clock position with a radio frequency probe just so that when you shift to the lateral portal, it is a little difficult to get the orientation at that point as to what is 2 o'clock and what is 5 o'clock. Then the capsule is excised about 
above from where the lower marking is made so you do not excise the capsule below the lower mark it's above that lower mark you would excise about a small triangle of about a 2 cm base and that triangle would have arms of about 2 cm each so it's more or less an equilateral triangle of a capsule that you would excise then you would go on and get the entire rotator interval uh, tissues off till you start seeing the coracobrachialis when you see the coracobrachialis this way then you know that you are very close to the coracoid and this is where you are going to start the dissection of the coracoid from so these are the primary settings at this point in time i would view from the posterior have one anterior portal and there would be one lateral portal which would be made here one to approach the inferior part of the coracoid and then later on to visualize it as well so this is the second step so to say that's the coracoid coming into picture that's the ca ligament i'm still visualizing from posterior i've turned my light cable so that i can see inner or the medial side and that's the ta that's taking the ca ligament off from the superior surface of the coracoid so as all of you all know the whole point here is to enucleate the coracoid leaving only the coracobrachialis attached and the lateral surface is fairly a safe surface there's really no major uh, structures there uh, which would be scary uh, on the medial side. So you start going towards the undersurface of the coracoid as well. That's the glenoid that you can see there. So you go towards the undersurface and erase the soft tissues. Your subscap would lie here and that would be the undersurface arc of the coracoid. So you can generally get about two thirds. Now then when you shift to the lateral portal, you can see everything in profile. You can see that the humeral head is here. The glenoid has a very straight border. So that is a significant loss. We'll not discuss about how much that is, but that's the superior marking and that's the inferior marking. So the extent of your graph should come from there to there. The capsule below that is retained. And at in front of the subscapularis is where you would have your coracoid process. So now you dissect into the uh, <coughs> chest wall between the pectoralis major and the minor your major is obviously on the right and the minor would be on the uh, inner side or the medial side till you get adequate dissection so as to be able to make the medial portal safely the aim of the medial portal as you can see coming here is to be able to dissect the pectoralis minor of the uh, coracoid itself and also then to provide the uh, portal for fixation of your coracoid block onto the glenoid so once you got the medial portal, then you would make an anterior nose dive portal as it's called, where basically you are seeing the coracoid end on. And you can see this is the coracobrachialis and that's the pectoralis minor coming from there. So somewhere here you seek the groove or the separation between the coracobrachialis and the pectoralis minor. It's not always very easy actually to do that, but once you find it, then you lead up all the way up there and you also need to separate down. And if the musculocutaneous nerve is a high nerve, you will see it there. You stay as flush and as close to the bone as is possible, obviously, because you do not want to play around to an area close to the brachial plexus. So as you would do in an open surgery, it would be dissected as close to the coracoid as is possible. And that is the absolute base of the coracoid. So at some point in time, you will connect what you have dissected laterally from what you are dissecting on the medial side. Once that is done, once that is done, it means that uh, you have completed that uh, through and through, you have clear access to the coracoid and uh, then thereafter you would probably be ready to go on to the next step. So now you can see that the entire coracoid all underneath is absolutely uh, skeletonized all the way through from the medial and from the lateral side. So there is nothing that's there. So your osteotomy can be safely made up to this point here and the entire soft tissue along with the brachial plexus is gone medially. Then comes the third step. This is how I do it. I use a triple sleeve uh, wherein basically right in the center of the coracoid towards the base, I pass my first K wire. Now, there are some instruments which are in evolution, but at the present point in time, I do agree and accept a fair bit of it is eyeballing, which hopefully will change with the passage of time. So you have one wire going right towards the base, then I measure the distance and exactly a centimeter apart, I put in the second wire, which is towards the tip of the coracoid see that wire come through as well all of this needs to be under visualization because you do not want to over penetrate then use the definitive drill bit and complete the drill holes uh, uh, in a suitable fashion to be able to accept the uh, screws when you are putting in i typically am using the arthrex implants at the present point in time so you keep a little protector underneath the place from where the drill bits are going to come to once you do that i sh use a burr in reverse and I freshen the undersurface of the coracoid that is hopefully to maximize the chances of healing of the coracoid when it's transferred onto the glenoid and then 
you make a stress riser in a almost a circumferential fashion because when you do the osteotomy you do not want that's the toughest place from where to bake it otherwise you get a spike of bone there so this stress riser i think is extremely important so just anterior to the coracoclavicular ligaments which is the deeper most extent of your osteotomy uh, you make a circumferential stress riser with the help of an acromionizer and then the osteotome you generally do not need a huge amount of force on the osteotome. This is exactly a centimeter wide. So the superior portal is also in fact just a little less than a centimeter wide because the skin will distend to allow the osteotome through. So once you've done that, once you've got a clear osteotomy, uh, if you had good stress risers made, then getting a clean osteotomy is usually not a problem. I am not trying to say I've never had any, but usually it's not a problem and you will get the coracoid piece coming off freely. Now, I do not at this point in time actually bother much about the coracoid at all. I let that piece lie free where it is and proceed to the next step, which is the subscapularis split. Now, actually, I have uh, not incorporated in this video, but before I do that, I isolate the axillary nerve, but the subscapularis split is made along the lower border, along the lower point where you have marked out uh, where the uh, uh, where the split needs to be made, where the lower extent of the graft is going to be. And I apologize in this video, I have been unable to include the part where I actually uh, see and isolate the axillary now. Starting from that point where your rod came out, you would then go laterally uh, into the tendinous part and get a good wide subscapular split. You would also need to go a little bit more medial to the medial border of the neck because you want the good rotations to be preserved post-operatively. So I, I think one of the problems associated with making an inadequate uh, uh, split is to get a restriction in your rotations post-op. So you need to have a wide split. I think once you've identified the axillary nerve, it's, it's, it's a little bit easier to be less scared of this area. It will ooze a little bit, but you can confidently go and dissect along the medial side of the neck as well. The next step would be to roughen this area, prepare it just like we did on the coracoid side. Again, obviously, so that you can optimize the chances of healing. And once you've done that, again, there is, uh, I use either a triple sleeve or an eccentric jig, which I have made, which presently is still under a uh, trial uh, sort of uh, studies. But then I would pass a wire into the coracoid, into the glenoid at a measured distance from the tip of the glenoid and make the primary hole. Now, this is where the technique differs in the sense that I do not yet use a jig which will clasp the coracoid, place it there and then mask. But here I put a wire through the hole in the proximal coracoid, put that through the subscapularis split and actually negotiate that into the hole into the glenoid and all you need to do is just push the coracoid block which happens automatically the minute you start tightening your screw. Okay, you can actually see the graft approaching the glenoid closer and closer. At this point, it's important not to let this border start becoming tilted. So what you would do is put a guide, presently I put a, a long rod and I uh, just sort of stabilize it while I then put the lower screw. So the lower drill bit is not made earlier. Through this, I would actually pass the wire, pass the drill and then pass the screw in. And before fully tightening the lower screw, uh, the, uh, before fully tightening the upper screw is when the lower screw is passed. And then you go back, tighten the upper screw and you will get a nice firm compression. You can actually see that blood getting squeezed out from there and uh, you get a good firm feel as well. So you do feel fairly confident at the end of it when you've got two fairly well spaced out screws. You measure them that they are a centimeter apart. Uh, the coracobricalis can be seen nicely coming over the lower border of the subscapularis and when your wires are out, uh, you can see that. Uh, it all looks pretty nice actually and since this is in no way different from what an open surgery would be done, if the open works then I really don't see any reason why the arthroscopic should not work. That's just looking at it again from the lateral portal, uh, making sure let the subscapularis fibers come down. You see that there is a good smooth arc which gets maintained. You have to be careful as to not to cause uh, cause a, a sort of a proud placement of the graft. That's the worst thing you want to do. Plus the screws are from the medial portal. They are from very anterior. So there's no chance that the screw head is really going to come anywhere near your humeral head. So I really find it difficult to believe that that screw head is really ever going to touch that humeral head anywhere because it's put in from well on the medial side. So there's no chance of that. Want to make sure that it is flush there. And uh, once that's done, you also want to take the arm through its range of movement and you can actually see that the Hillsack lesion 
uh, then comes nowhere really near at all uh, near the edge of the anterior glenoid. So, you definitely, definitely as far as the static effect is concerned, you can immediately see that when you, you start taking this arm in abduction and external rotation, it, that, that hill sack comes nowhere near where uh, the normal edge of the glenoid which is over here would have. So, all I am trying to say here is that uh, and um, we would mobilize them fairly early. This is at 6 weeks after the surgery. So, the sling lasts for barely 2 weeks. These are the portals. Uh, I, I, I think the issue here is not really whether it is better to do it arthroscopically or whether an open will give the same result uh, or whether the arthroscopic will give the same result or whether the incisions added up will give you the same length as the total incision you would have when you do it open. All I am trying to say is that it is possible to do it arthroscopically. It is not that much more difficult and there is no compromise on the visibility at any point in time. In fact, you can dissect the nerves better. You are in complete control of the situation and therefore, I think it is food for thought. All I am trying to say is that if you wish to do it arthroscopically, of course, there are commercial kits available, but there is a technique possible. It is an easier technique. It is a simpler technique and that is the screw placement. You can see that they are both parallel to each other. They go well away from the glenoid. You have seen that on your visual scale as well that they are no, nowhere near inside the glenoid. So, that is just sharing my thought process with you as far as the arthroscopic lethargy is concerned. Thank you very much for that opportunity. Uh, I'm not a skeptic of the arthroscopic lethargy. In fact, uh, we are also doing both the arthroscopic electrus graft and the arthroscopic lethargy to see which one works better, and uh, we'll be toying with these over here. The one message that must go through, and the distinct difference between an open lethargy and arthroscopic lethargy, and that's my only quarrel with arthroscopic lethargy, is the capsular labrum structures are not addressed. The the Joe Debeer technique involves a complete bankard repair with a lethargy because you can have a patient who stopped dislocating but still has inner instability because he is unable to throw because the capsule labrum is a very important part of the open lethargy. Okay. I, let me just try and answer that. I may not be able to answer that convincingly, but anecdotally. Uh, I think Ashish, both you and I probably are not yet at the stage where we have done enough lethargies arthroscopically to really say whether for us this is the procedure forward or no. Though I think I am pretty convinced about it. But just as you talk about Jody Bear and the fact that he probably stitches it back, I too have spent some time with Laura LaFosse where he does not stitch it back. And at that point in time when I was with him, he had crossed well over a thousand cases of an arthroscopy. And I have seen uh, him rescope some patients who have had an arthroscopic lethargy done before over a year prior to the rescopy, and you actually see a good tissue forming there which has formed there like a capsule maybe the thickness is not the same as a capsule them, and uh, and uh, and that's, uh, that's okay that's like no, hear me out ashish hear me out you need to hear me out so i think the point here is that i don't think you can make a big issue of whether to fix the capsule back or not to fix it back that's personal preference maybe depending on whom you're trained with or what works for you all i'm trying to say today especially in today's lecture was not to propagate lethargy surgery today's lecture was just to show a technique where it is possible to do it in a perhaps a, a more conducive circumstances for the Indian settings. No, no, I am not saying you put him down. <laughs> you may not be able to. When you made the comment that we are doing the same thing that was done open lethargy, yeah. the audience needs to know that open lethargy is a different procedure because the capsular slack is also an important part of instability repair. I have spent time with LaFosse, we have been there for a few weeks and I have seen that the capsule that he shows is a pseudo capsule, it is a fibrous tissue, it is not imbricated. Fair enough. I mean, I think that is your I viewpoint and that is a very valid viewpoint. I am not too convinced about it, but then that is just personal. Uh, one comment uh, regarding arthroscopic lethargy. If you read the uh, 2B3 procedure of Pasteur, they do it arthroscopically, but they do Bancard's repair also in addition to yeah. doing arthroscopic lethargy. The so, sure. do you think that procedure would score over there the are LaFosse technique? There are four or five centers that are working towards this. So, Mikhail from uh, Berlin, uh, Pascal, they are all developing that. The difficult, the, the the feasibility of arthroscopic lethargy is with the capsule being completely burnt off. 
it makes the job easy you do not burn out the whole capsule actually uh, you do Laura, not Laura takes off the entire yeah but that's what i showed you this technique where does not do that you do not burn that off has not finalized his technique because he's struggling but pascal pascal has designed his instrument but he's not finalized them because he's trying to retain he's quite right he wants to retain the capsule liver the arthroscopic ileacris procedure you are able to keep it and that's what he's doing he's keeping the labrum but putting an ileac crest but then there's no sling so there are pros and cons of each procedure and these but are procedures in evolution but so at sure. the same time if you speak to Monica uh, come to uh, uh, so just points if you speak to Debel regarding uh, the capsular repair he says it's not a stabilizing structure it's only to make the craft extra capsule exactly so if you're so getting the pseudo membrane the formation Joe Debel uses it because the whole you see the concept they stop dislocating but they still have instability the, you should see the evolution of the bank card the capsule undergoes plastic deformation ig stretches and then the labrum breaks that's why when we do a bank card we imbricate the capsule it is, i am doing both procedures i am doing the arthroscopic electress and the uh, arthroscopic lethargy but I need to know a procedure where I can combine both together. I would be much more happier because sure. I would be much more anatomical. So then how do you do your arthroscopic lethargies? We are doing the Glafos procedure with the uh, deputy kit. I can't do the labrum repair with it because... Then why do it? The, that's why I am doing the arthroscopic eyelacrus also. Because that so which are your patients whom you decide to take for the uh, lethargy vis-a-vis -vis the eyelacrus? We are doing a randomized, so both of them. Okay. Can I just make a, a short uh, comment? Uh, I fully agree with you that if you do both procedures together, that would be the, the, the ideal scenario. The soft tissue uh, fixation plus the bony block, okay? But uh, I, I, I cannot do the surgery. I have a friend in Brazil who has already done 36 cases with absolutely no special devices, nothing special, and he's about to publish. I can give you the name and his email if you want. But Please. my comment is this. I, I know how to do open bristles very well. And I have done probably more than 40 cases, uh, probably more. And I never address the soft tissues. I only do the bony block itself. And uh, my patients are always fine. So uh, in spite of the fact that doing both procedures is ideal, I fully agree. The bony block itself, it works. This is a time proven technique. When, when, for, when much before Gilles Vauch, the surgery was created by, by Mr. Uh, Pate, uh, Pate, uh, Pate, 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 Pate. Uh, 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 he didn't think about, about this, the, the soft, the, the, the soft mm -hmm. tissue. 20 years ago, Gilles Vauch <coughs> had a brilliant idea. Once you are removing the, the coracoid, you can use the coracoacromial ligament to reattach uh, the capsule. But the, the surgery was created probably 20 or 30 years before, and it was working. So my, the, my message is yes. the bony block itself works. Yeah, we will know. Huh? It, it's going to take us a long time to find out what's the yes. because there are so many versions of the Lata Sure. Uh, Gilles Walpusher, when he uses the CA ligament, the CA ligament is attached to the superior part of the carpet. In the tip? Yeah. Yeah, on the, on the lateral surface. Yeah. Yes, on yes, the superior yes, part yes. of the body. Yeah. Yes, superior. And then yes, he, yes, yes, he yes. puts the graft sleeping position uh, just as it is. So yes. the inferior part of the coracoid becomes the articulating yes. surface. Sure. In which case, the capsule, the CA ligament which behaves like a capsule, is yes. attached still to the yes. far away part. Sure. So it's not doing. Whereas Jody Bear turns the whole thing over to make it a congruent arc. Yes. And uh, so I'm not sure the CA ligament works as a capsule because it's not anatomically aligned. I know. I know. So, yeah, 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 yeah. So there are so many variations. Yeah. And because it is just going to be impossible for us to know that this variation is the perfect variation. Sure. But okay. that's what we need to study and criticize yeah. this procedure. Yeah. To read it. Okay. I think we need to carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, he's doing some science over there. Uh, Next is Sergio, who's going to talk to us about his please take me of money bankers repair.